Welcome back to the Fitter and Faster Coaches Corner. As always, I'm your host, Mike Murray. Today, I am thrilled to introduce you to my longtime friend and colleague on the pool deck. We shared many a pool deck on the Eastern Zone during our developmental days as coaches. Mohammed, how are you today? Where are you joining us from? Hey, Mike, how are you doing? I am uh, in Springdale, Arkansas with the Razorback Aquatic Club, uh, Aquahog. This is our facility, the Jones Center. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be on, on the webcast and uh, to, to chat with you and hopefully contribute. Well, we're excited to have you, man. You know, we were talking pre-production about how our paths have intersected so many different times throughout our careers, especially as young coaches in the metropolitan New York area. One thing that always impressed me was your energy and enthusiasm, enthusiasm on deck uh, was as palpable as mine, and you had mentioned that to me, so I appreciate that. Today, we're talking about developing a strong team culture and a, a culture of achievement. And what does that mean to you, Mo, and, and the programs that you've been with? You're most well known for your work at Scarlet, um, and now you're down south in Arkansas. So, talk to us a little bit about what team culture <clears throat> meant to you while you were at Scarlet. Uh, how you fit into the bigger picture of Scarlet, because I know there's a long-standing tradition of excellence there. As, as a former Rutgers student, um, I, was, I was able to see a lot of that success uh, when I was in college. So talk to us about that. Okay, so um, Scarlet was a multi-site program. I started uh, coaching in 2008 with the Bayonne Mermaids and Starfish in Bayonne, New Jersey. It was a uh, 50 kids swam four days a week, very recreational. I actually swam on that team and then I went on to swim at Montclair State University. And for as long as I've known, uh, I've wanted to be a swim coach. I went to university, to college to study exercise science so that I can be a swim coach. Uh, I started doing it in the summers. And I, I, I mean, I got, I got thrown into it uh, pretty quick, pretty young at, at very different levels. But uh, at Scarlet, I started with them in 2012 when the Bayo Mermaid Starfish merged with them, uh, with Scarlet Aquatic. And it was four different sites that merged together. The original Scarlet at Rutgers University, uh, the original Paramus Red Wave or New Jersey Wave out of, um, out of Bergen County, uh, Elite Swim Club, which was out of Morris County, and then our program. Our program was probably the smallest of them all and the least established of them all. I, I just got sort of lucky in, in making some good contacts with uh, Tom Speedling and, and Ken O'Reilly. And uh, they were, again, that we, we always talk about mentorship and learning and, and reaching out to people. When I, when I started with the Veil Mermaid Starfish, I uh, called Ken and I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm new to New Jersey swimming, I'm new to coaching. You are having a tremendous amount of success. How do you do it? And he said, well, the first thing you got to do is change the name of the team. You can't be very competitive as the mermaids and starfish. And, you know, we had a good chuckle about that, but uh, it was sort of in the back of my mind, you know, we, we, we started developing some athletes and, you know, at one point we went to the Columbus uh, Grand Prix and I had a, a swimmer in 2010 or 2011 uh, make it to finals and as they're announcing the name it, it sounded pretty much like a swimmer from you know University of Michigan and Ohio State so uh, I knew that it seemed a little bit silly that to put so much weight in the name and I was proud of the Bayo Mermaid Starfish and, and all of that but uh, I did I did always have a vision for more than a recreation program which is what it was um, and so I reached out to those guys they became mentors and eventually they eventually we became a team and we worked together and, and uh, I had a great run with them. They're still doing some amazing things. Um, and, you know, I was, we start, joined them in 2012 and we, uh, I, I left basically in uh, 2020 after the, you know, mid, midway through the pandemic in July of 2020, uh, I came out here to, to accept the head senior uh, job at um, the Razorback Aquatic Club. Um, but Scarlet in itself uh, was was a really cool experience. Like it was 
kind of a, a brotherhood between Ken, Tom, Bill, and I. Um, we did a, we did a lot of things together. We uh, we cheered for each other as kids. We made each other better. It was you know iron sharpens iron kind of thing. And I learned so much from those guys uh, that you know I still carry with me uh, day in and day out. I'm very grateful for my time there. Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question. I, I know there's there's a ton more detail that I can go uh, about like the dynamic of the whole thing, but. Um, it, was, it was really great to see you guys link up and really become a, a powerhouse force in the Eastern zone. And, you know, Bill mm -hmm. Deatley, what a tremendous coach in his own right. Ken O'Reilly, somebody that I've looked up to in my career. And then Tom Speedling, who's just next level when it comes to creating an atmosphere of work, right? And everybody oh, yeah. knows that at Victor, we like to say work works. What was oh, yeah. it like to uh, learn from Tom and Ken and Bill? And how have you taken some of those things from Scarlet and incorporated it into Razorbacks as you get started here? Sure. So, um, it, it, like you said, they're all different. Bill and, and Ken and Tom are very different individuals. Tom was uh, very work-based, but also he, he has his own ideas of what a committed young athlete is. Uh, and when I first started coaching, that was kind of my blueprint, right? It was like, you're there all the time, you, you work your tail off, you do amazing things. And you know, you go to battle with your teammates. But there was, uh, and I love Tom, but there was very little wiggle room uh, within the structure of the program. Uh, and, you know, it works for him. But uh, I tried that to start and uh, I, I felt like there was a lot of good things, it, it, especially when you're starting a new culture, like I think being tougher and harder when you're starting is uh, important and then you could scale back a little bit. But uh, some of the things uh, didn't make, a, some of the things just didn't cater to my style in terms of, uh, I think, you know, we all grew up in this culture of swimming where if, you missed one practice, your season is over. Or if you did one thing wrong, you know, you weren't committed or uh, all, all those uh, crazy things that we kind of grew up and it was considered common practice. And, and those are the things that started not making sense to me. You know, you, you, if, if, a, if a kid was motivated to do high school, I was okay with that. Um, I was okay with that, but I also expected them to uh, really commit to their goals and then have a plan that might not look the same as everybody else's plan, right? So it's a, it's a catch 22, I think, um, you know, with that work culture, it's, it's really, really important to establish, but how I've adapted from that is, is that um, it, I feel like it's easy, it's harder and it's easier. It's harder in that it's, it's really tough to, to hold everybody to the same standard regardless of what their motivation is but then it's easier because everybody's doing the same thing and it's not that it's on autopilot but like you've got one plan everybody's in the pool at the same time you're doing what you need to do and you know hopefully it works right where now where I'm at is I expect everybody to want to be as good as they could be okay but I understand that uh uh I understand that there's just so many different ways to get there. And uh, honestly, my experience at Scarlet taught me that, right? So we, we started picking up, we started developing some talent. We, uh, we started having some great success, whether it was some international swimmers early on. And then we had uh, a, a few local swimmers that have done some pretty cool things and, uh, and they got really, really good. And we started attracting some talent from, from different areas. So we had kids driving 50 minutes to come swim for us. Well, morning practice wasn't a possibility. So uh, we have to figure it out, right? So like a, a culture where a kid that showed up every afternoon but wasn't able to come to the morning was still equal to the kid that's committed. And well, not committed, I shouldn't use that term, but a kid that's coming nine times a week was still equal to, to somebody else that might need something different to be successful. Um, so I try to establish like, hey, we can get it done a million different ways, but let's, let's buy into the fact that we can do this together 
how do I spark this team? How do I, how do I get these kids to achieve and, and parents and, and um, a lot of different, you know, um, there's just so many different lessons that you get from, from not having everything that you need that, um, and I, I guess that's the ultimate thing, you know, at Scarlet, I had the resources as far as like coaches and I have so many different mentors, uh, but as far as like pool time, pool space, resources, uh, facilities, it's just, you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do and you gotta figure it out. And, uh, it's, and there's no better educator, you know? No, there's no doubt about that, Mo. And you were able to do a lot uh, with the bandwidth that you had too. I know you're passionate about college coaching and you coached at St. Peter's for a year. Uh, I also coached in that conference at Marist. Um, Talk to me about what you learned from college coaching and how you take that into the program at Arkansas now. And that, so the, the, in, in college coaching, I was really young. I started at, uh, I was probably the youngest division one head coach when I started at St. Peter's. So I started in 2009. I was probably 22 going on 23. Um, it was a small school. And the way I started there, Mike was, Again, I was coaching this small club and I was looking for more space and we were training out of an elementary school and I was looking for more morning time, right? Because I wanted to elevate this program. And the guy that's at St. Peter's at the time said, hey, if you come help me out a couple mornings a week, uh, you could swim here for free with your club, right? So I go there and I'm like, okay, fine. You know, I'll coach Monday, Wednesdays and my, my club team will come in uh, Tuesday, Thursday, I don't remember the exact schedule, but it's something along those lines. And then I go there and man, there was some talent in that pool, right? And it's like, you look at what they were able to accomplish versus what was in that pool. Like the kid that made NCAAs, when I walked in there, he was, I think he finished third or fourth in the conference, didn't even shave his freshman year. He went like 57 or something. And it was, he wasn't the only one. There were a lot of different uh, kids that came through and I mean, I guess one of, one of my other passions is just like, let's see how fast we can get, right? And, and let's figure out a way. And, and that kind of got me hooked. I started coaching there a couple of days a week. And by the end of the season, I was, you know, I was probably running 18 workouts a week between like the Bayonne team and, and the St. Peter's team. And uh, I, I always joked with my brother. I'm like, I feel like I got my 10,000 hours in the first four years of coaching because I was running like 20 workouts a week between all these different things I was doing. Um, but obviously it was just it's a joke, but yeah, so, uh, it was fun working with, uh, working with really good athletes. Some of those kids were practically my age. Like we had a couple of European kids that were literally older than me when I started, which was wild. Uh, but, uh, I, I think honestly, what I take back from that experience is I wasn't ready for it. You know, I was ready for, uh, the excitement of, coaching athletes but there's just so much more that goes into that and uh if you're not if you're not at a place that's got the support and if you're uh, meaning like you know the the uh the staff behind you and and you know what it's like at that conference right you you're basically working with volunteer assistants um grad assistants in in the athletic department volunteer assistants on deck and i was just not really ready for all of the dry stuff outside of uh, coaching. Uh, and I made some mistakes, but I feel like I can look back on that. And I, I always looked at it like, well, I've got plenty of time in my life if I, if I wanna keep doing this to correct those mistakes, meaning like there's plenty more good to do. And I feel like over the last, I know it's only been seven or eight years or so, I've, I've, I've always, all my athletes have a good experience working with me me um and my athletes at St. Peter's had a good experience working with me it was just I, I feel like there's just there were some mistakes made and I just I owned up to them and now it's I can just focus on focus on continuing to do what I'm passionate about continuing to develop people continuing to develop them as athletes and and, and individuals and and uh just just kind of I just love getting up and going to work and making people better and making myself better. It's just pretty awesome. So I, I love that, man. And it's so true. And, it, and it's a hundred percent genuine and people who know, you know, that um, I do want to talk to you about 
setting the expectation of achievement at practice and what that's led to within your program. You know, I was very fortunate to be on the national select camp staff a few years ago. And I had Dari in my group, one of Dari Rose, one of your best swimmers um, throughout the last uh, four or five years. Uh, great 200 backstroker, I think ended up making the junior national team. Um, did a great job. Talk to me about the development of Dari, where he is right now and how he's swimming. Okay, so uh, yeah, he was a flyer, a turn, turn middle distance freestyler. Uh, Dari is so, so gifted. You know, he, I, I think I've worked with, fortunately, I've worked with so many really good athletes and they teach you so much more than you teach them and they don't know that they're doing it. So uh, he, he was just so gifted, man. I, I remember he was 11 years old and swimming in the team and it was a small team. So I got to work with a lot of different people and in the pool deck, there were uh, Jonathan and Matea who ended up, you know, competing at the Olympics and making semifinals and, uh, having a great time and Johannes who was like 14 at the time and I just watched this kid swim and I'm like holy crap this is just like man he was a beautiful swimmer I I I I, I was just guiding him you know but um, it was nice for him he had he also was fortunate to have those examples so he saw Johannes and he saw Jonathan and he saw Matea and he saw like what was possible in the sport uh but for him, again, it was a different approach, right? I, I, he was, I worked with him from 11 to 17, and then he's now at uh, Cal. He scored his freshman year in the 200 butterfly at NCAAs, which is, I think, a pretty big deal. Um, he's, he swam from lifetime best this past summer in long course, which was always our focus. Uh, but he, he's, he's, uh, he was one that, I feel like with a small team of 60 or 70 kids, you kind of have to like not cherry pick or but identify like, okay, this kid could be really special. And I sat down with his parents at 12 uh, and I said, you know, the, the future could be really bright for him if, if, if he does, if he really, you know, follows this as a, as a path. Uh, and, and they were awesome. And they've always done whatever I asked to do and, provided whatever resources he needed, um, but very technically sound. I, I would say 11, 12, 13, it was mainly technical work. He's never, he didn't start doing doubles until he got into high school, uh, maybe in the summer once or twice, or, you know, in two or three weeks, he'd get some doubles in. But I mean, he set a national age group record at 12 and then he, he set some other national age group records at 14 and then made the junior team. He went 351 in the 400 free. Uh, and 149 as a 15 year old boy. I mean, those are some big boy swims right there and, and uh, did some pretty, pretty cool things for the national junior team at Junior Pampax and Junior World. Um, but I, I would say with Dare, we had a, with, and, and I do this with really all of my athletes now, kind of as I was alluding earlier, it's just like we sat down every year and we figured out like, okay, what's important to you? And how do we try to fit it all in? And, you know, we, we established a relationship where he can come to me and say, Hey, my school is doing a walk for, you know, mental health awareness. And can I skip practice if I make it up on this day? And like, yeah, absolutely. You know, so we developed a pretty good relationship, but I was very heavily invested in his development every, there every step of the way. When he started strength training, I would go to the strength training sessions on top of our, like he, he started doing strength training, uh, again, we didn't have the gym or the resources or what have you. So we, we outsourced for that a little bit earlier in her uh, career. And, um, and I would go to these sessions and just be really involved in the uh, year to year development. Um, and I've learned a lot. I could have done better for sure. I, I mean, I look back at every athlete and I'm like, I want another crack at it, <laughs> you know, but I think, uh, yeah, I don't know. So it, it was fun working with him and, I'm really excited for his future just because he's, he's one of those kids that one, he was a year ahead of where he needed to be in school. So like he stepped, he stepped on campus uh, at Cal as a 17 year old boy. Right. So he didn't turn 18 until almost the end of the first semester. And then, you know, that year scored at NCAA. So you, you that? go, yeah, that's a, I think that's a big deal. I think that's a really big deal. We, we talked, 
not as often as I, uh, you know, we, he's busy, I'm busy, but we definitely touch base like once or once every few weeks or so I'll reach out, I'll reach out. And it sounds like he's doing some pretty amazing thing. Coach Chase uh, usually texts me some pretty good sets that he's doing and he's definitely being challenged with some of the pros and some of, some of the other incredible athletes at Cal. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what he's going to be able to do in the future because I know some of the some of the sets that have been communicated with me are uh, are just uh, kind of a window through what what mm. might happen, you know, when he's uh, a little bit older and more ready to compete as a man, you know. Mo, well, give us a set that Dari did one time that really impressed you. Doesn't have to be too specific, but I, I know that you like to train and we want to be wowed. You want to be wowed. Okay. So we, uh, every December to go on a training camp. And this is a set that's actually kind of a staple in my program. Not as much recently, just because we're building up to that sort of stuff. But at Scarlet, I've had a few years with these kids. But once a week, we would do, we would build up to it early season. Uh, but once a week, we do like, 40 50s or 50 50s butterfly and we'd manipulate the intervals or different variables or what have you but there was a training camp and and this is a great culture piece right there's we do a training camp in St. Mary's the last workout me and Ken O'Reilly Chuck Batchelor and Bluefish joined us one year uh but me and Ken O'Reilly we and we we like to end the camp with we're going to warm up for like three or four thousand if we long course and then we're going to get in we're going to go 60 50s fly and then the different levels go on different intervals, right? So 60, 50s fly. And I had Jonathan and Dare and Gabe, another, another kid who ended up making trials in the 200 butterfly uh, swimming. And um, so the A interval was on 50. The B interval was on 55. The C interval was on a minute. Uh, so they're going and they're like, hey, five kicks off the wall. You're finishing, you're finishing every lap well. There's not like you can't sprint 50 50s or 60 50s fly on 50, but we want them consistent, right? And Jonathan and Dari were probably going pushing 31s and 32s pretty consistently for 60 50s fly. And then when the A interval was finished, the B interval I think still had six or seven 50s to go, and the C interval still had like 10 or 12 50s to go. So we're like, we did, we did this every year. So uh, and this was maybe Dari's first or second time doing it. So it was like, okay, you have a choice when you're done with your set. You're either getting in those kids' faces and getting them really riled up about finishing the set, or you're going to go alongside them and you're going to, and you're going to swim the rest of the set with them. And normally most kids just stayed in the pool and just kept doing the fifties and it got really rowdy. So, you know, six more fifties getting a little faster. Now he's getting five extra seconds of rest. And then the B interval finished and the C interval is going. And again, same option. You can get out and cheer or you can keep going. And most kids would, cheer, would choose to keep going. Uh, and then by the end of it all, it was like 72 or 73, 50 fly. The last five or six on a minute or so. And I remember him pushing like a 27 high on the last 50 fly after all that fly. And, uh, and like next to Jonathan, who was pushing him and doing the same thing. And um, I feel like the, that one practice every year probably makes 10 swimmers, right? Like it makes their season. It gives them this swagger and confidence. And, you know, they just walk around like you're not, there's nothing you could do to me, you know? Um, so I, I, I think that was one of those like spark moments where, okay. And we always, I mean, I think there was <clears throat> that year we had six boys under the junior cut long course. Uh, so six boys that were 205 or better at long course fly um, out of my side of Scarlet, you know, Johannes, Dari, I mean, a couple of them were bums, but it was, I thought that was, I felt like those sets definitely contributed to that, you know. Oh, no doubt about it, man. And, and I'm, I'm jealous that I wasn't at that training camp. I, I had, I had a couple of kids who would have been able to eat that kind of stuff up and, when you talk about being on deck at a training camp like that with uh, Chuck and Ken and Tom, talk about like how exciting it is when you're witnessing athletes push some physical limits. Oh, I mean, it's so cool. I mean, it, it's fun to watch like other coaches work with your kids too. just, 
I, the 2015, December 2015, so going into 2016 was the blue, the camp we did with Bluefish. And Chuck had some really successful, I mean, obviously Chuck always has some really successful athletes, but uh, I mean, that year he got a chance to work with Jonathan McKay and, and he definitely was, uh, he was so helpful that year. I mean, I, I'd call him up and I mean, he, he was one of the first people that made me start kind of thinking outside the box in terms of, in terms of like, you can get it, Chuck is a get it done kind of guy, right? You have kids that travel, you know, five times a week, seven times a week, 12 times, whatever it takes, he's going to figure out a way to make those kids fast and it's old that we all grew up with, right? Um, and and just watching him being able to do that and experiencing it that year. I mean, he was a big part of uh, why those kids swam as well as they did at the end of that summer. Um, I mean, obviously he's not on deck with them day in and day out, but he was like, I was, he was my earpiece, right? I called him regularly, like, hey, you know, it was the first, it was, I mean, it was the first time, like, I thought, oh, you could swim fast all the time. Cool. <laughs> like, I mean, if you ever go to meets with Chuck and Bluefish and you'll see that it'll be like April and some kids just going off could be October and another kid's going off and it's like he doesn't get in the way of that and he just promotes it and I think for a lot of years prior to seeing that I would get in the way of things like that a little bit like we're not ready yet or you know we haven't done this or we haven't done that and it's just like with him it was like you're always ready you're just going to keep getting better you know so I, I thought that that was I, I feel like that's one of the biggest catalysts or accelerators in my in my coaching is just being open to the idea that there's just so many different ways to get it done, you know, um, and find find reasons to be successful rather than reasons not to be successful. Oh, that's that's a great quote right there. And that's one that I'm probably going to steal from you and use. Um, I do want to show you uh, most something because I think you'll appreciate this because there are there are a few people uh especially you know in the generation that we grew up early in our careers coaching that still go to the lengths uh quite literally that you and i will go to <laughs> in training and uh one of the things that i like to do on coach's corner is is really share a lot of stuff so cool uh i'm going to share this with with you right now and you're going to see that tonight uh we, we are getting after it if you look at that bottom line uh, we're, we're going to get 10 grand in tonight. Uh, nice. And, and I, I bring it up because it, it it's, um, uh, you know, you, you talk about a culture of achievement and doing things that the kids might not, you might not think they're ready for, but, but you know that they can handle it. Right. And, uh, for sure. This is not something for those that are watching or listening that our athletes do every night. But we had a rare opportunity to get two and a half hours of pool time. And similarly, as you mentioned earlier in, in the interview, Muhammad, is we got to take advantage of it. And we, we only had 90 minutes last night because there was a high school meet. So we did a lactate set of four 400 IMs last night. That was a whole main set. Four nice. 400 IMs on 12 minutes. Our boys were like 416 to 420. They were doing a great job. That's awesome. And then tonight we got some room, so we're getting after it. And, yeah. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't share this to like scare people, but when, when you're lucky to coach athletes like a Mateus Shamarjic and le, like a Jonathan and like some Dari and, and Matthias, some of the kids that you've had, or, you know, a Michaela Sargent and a Noah Stevens and some of the kids that we've been lucky to have, they can handle work like that. So Talk about the way that you communicate to your athletes that they're capable of work ethic that's so much farther beyond what, what they think they're capable of. Oh, this is fun. So I think you just like, you have to be excited about it, right? Yeah. So, so for me, I, I think, so um, again, this is not an every night kind of deal, 60, 50 fly, not an every night kind of deal. And, and I am a big firm believer in season planning and, and like doing work at the right time to so just not, not doing it just for the sake of doing it. Right. Um, but you just have to get excited about it. So I, I think of two examples, one recently here at, with the Aquahogs at the Razorback Aquatic Club, uh, 
I, I do believe that work is what drives the performances, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be doing the work up until the day before you do the performance, but work is, or the capacity is what drives the ultimate performance. So we always have a work in phase in our season. And I get really excited about that. So last season with our long course, I, you know, I, I sat down the, the kids with a big whiteboard and I write down the meets, I write down what weeks, I write down when we're going to be working hard, when we're going to be maybe backing off a little bit, what our focus meets are going to be. And I just say like, hey, the next six weeks, it's going to be, it's going to be whatever it's going to be, right? And uh, so uh, I, I always get excited about Cinco de Mayo and, and we do Cinco de Mayo, right? So every day, maybe for like a week or 10 days prior to Cinco de Mayo, and I'm like, I can't wait for Cinco de Mayo. And the kids are like, wait, what are we going to do? You know, I'm like, oh, wait until you see. And then, you know, maybe three or four days to go, I'm like, we're going to go Cinco de Mayo. And then the day comes and the kids are like, they kind of know it's coming. They're excited for it. And, and then uh, they, they did a great job. And I had a boy, I don't remember the exact times, but I think he might have been from a push 16, 20 something on the last one. And that kid ended up making the junior cut this past summer. And he went 16.02 and 8.21. He's 14, right? And so, I mean, it's pretty exciting. And I feel like, you know, you're, we're doing that work and that's what drives that performance, but also very excited about it. Get the kids like, hey, this is going to pay off. And you walk in with a smile on your face and you're like, we're going to get after it. And then, the other example I remember, uh, my last short course season with Scarlett, uh, Thanksgiving week, right? So like we always go to the holiday classic or winter juniors and Thanksgiving week happened to fall 10 days out of those meets. And we had started like, we had done like a reverse periodization that week, that year. It was like a, a, a trying to be re re really ready for trials for the kids that were doing that. So we started that year kind of fast, right? We were doing some we we're doing some faster stuff earlier than we normally would. And we're trying to be better earlier than we normally would. But we got to the point in, in uh, that Thanksgiving week. And I was just like, I think we really need to like bump up our capacity going into these rest meets, right? So um, like Monday, we did our normal double. Tuesday, we did our normal double, but we threw in 50-50 fly that afternoon. And then like that whole week, I'm like, Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, we're going 10,000 for time. And then the kids are like, they, that day they walked in with a smile on their face, getting ready to do a 10 K for time. But you know, I wimped out, we went three, 3000s instead. Uh, then they had Thanksgiving off and then we did a great practice uh, Friday. It was like hundred on a minute, 50 on a minute, like a bunch of rounds like that, 75 on 45, 50 on 45 bunch. Of, and they were flying, like just swimming so fast, right? And then Monday came and we were 10 days out. And I'm like, all right, guys, time to get ready. Like we did our hardest, our hardest week of work, like leading up to that. And we swam out of our freaking minds. Like everybody on the team swam so fast in those meets in December. And I mean, I just think part of it is the confidence, but part of it is like, and don't get me wrong, it's not always rainbows and sunshine, because there are there are times where you want to do the work and the kids maybe had a bad day or may, whatever, right? So, but you try to you try to communicate as much as possible why they're doing it, okay? And then you try to be excited about doing it. And then when it's going on, you have to be engaged while it's going on. Like you can't go three three thousands and not be jumping up and down the pool. Like if you expect them to give any kind of effort, you can't be on your phone. You can't be, you just can't, you just have to be maximum engagement, whatever. It, mostly cheerleading, to be honest, right? But you're not, you're not counting stroke on a 3000 back with a band. So that's what the, the 3000s were. One was seven, 400 IMs and a 200 free race continuous. Yep. One was um, fins and paddles freestyle. And then the last one was backstroke with a band. So a band around your ankle and you're just cranking. And I like, Johannes, who was 201, long course, ended up going 158. I mean, he, got, he would do like a 2,000, 3,000 with a band and hold sub 110 backstroke, right? And Chuck Batcher says, if you want to break two, two minutes long course, you got to break six minutes with a, you know, with a backstrap. On a 600 backstrap race, you got to be able to hold under a minute. If you could do that, you could break two minutes long course. And it works, right? Like, because he believes that it works and he gets kids to do that. And if you get a kid to go, 
555 with a with a band around their ankle swimming backstroke like don't you think they're going to be able to rip a 200 back you know i mean there's definitely other ways to get it done but if you get your athletes to believe like hey what we're doing here is going to result in xyz and then you execute it i feel like that's the magic right there you know and and it could be with anything right like right now um we we've got some athletes that are a little bit more speed oriented so i'm i'm really kind of digging my heels in to try to learn as much as I can about how do I get these kids to be good at the 50 and the 100 and the 200, you know? Um, and I feel like that was, a, that is a weakness or was a weakness. I, I'm getting better. You know, I, I probably don't give myself enough credit because we've still had people successful in fifties and hundreds, but I, I not at the same level as other events. Um, and again, I don't want to, I don't, um, I don't want to use the excuse that they're not big enough or strong enough, or they're still young. Like clearly there are people getting it done. So let's figure out how. No doubt, man. No doubt yeah. about it. And you know, what, what I love about that stuff is you talk about how it empowers your athletes for sure. I mean, we've had kids, we were, we were similarly, we were eight days out of uh, open water nationals. And one of the athletes had never done open water nationals before. And I was like, all right, at the end of this week on Friday, we're going to go six, 1200 IMs, descend one to three, four to six. And then the next day we're going to go just a 5k for time uh, in the middle of an 8,000 yard workout. We had, we had kids like make open water select camp coming out of that experience just because they they were like you kidding me i just got to go around these buoys a couple times <laughs> if you give them the ability and and you give them a programmatic message that says like you can do any when you get to the meet that's the easy part man yeah you know for and, sure. and i've i've admired that about scarlet i've admired that about your athletes specifically um and and it's good to know that there are people out there and I, and I talked to Chuck about this too when we were at Futures this year. There are still people out there that can get it done in a way that some people might think old school and some people might think it, it gets garbage yards, but hey man, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And, and, and if it works and you're not hurting people, you know, one thing that I love to hear our kids say when they come back from college is, I didn't see anything that scared me. You know, I was able to attack everything. Yeah. And, uh, and, and even in life, I, I actually shared this with my athletes that are like beginning of the season meeting. I got a random text message from a kid that I coached with the Bayo Mermaid Starfish 10 years ago, or maybe nine years ago. And you could edit this out. There's probably a little bit of, um, no, this is great. Okay. So this kid, immature boy, we know how they are 15 years old at the time or 14 years old at the time and could not figure out how to, pack his freaking paddles right like every single day we're doing a pull set it's like i don't have my paddle i forgot my paddle i have one paddle my straps aren't on whatever so i got fed up one day and i'm like all right you know what you just run the set you don't need paddles to do that right it, this was outdoors long course so there was like you know it was cemented around it was there's no danger of slipping right and the kid got out and started running but he didn't have shoes on he's running bare feet on cement right and he did it for maybe a half hour or so and I get a text message. Hey, remember that time you made me do this? Well, you know, I'm now training for Buds and he's, he's starting, um, he's, he's starting in November for the Navy SEALs. And he's like, I just, I just want to let you know that the other day on my run, uh, that, that came back to my mind and it gave me the willpower to, to finish this grueling workout. And uh, I just wanted to thank you for that. And this kid never even swam in college. Right. So it was just like, and now I'm doing this. And, uh, you know, the experience swimming for you or swimming for X team is, is kind of a big part of why I have the mental, you know, the mental fortitude to be able to do this. And you know, it kind of brought tears to my eyes. It's like, ultimately, like, that's why we're doing this, right? We're empowering athletes to make them better swimmers and better people, but to make them believe that, you know, they can run through walls. And I just, I, I know, like, I know X's and O's aside, I feel like that's probably one of one of the best qualities of a coach, and I feel like that's one thing I excel at. Is when we get to if we get to a meet, you're gonna believe you're gonna do some pretty good things, you know. Uh, regardless of what 
I shouldn't say regardless of what your preparation was like, but regardless of your, whether your preparation was perfect or not perfect, and, and almost always it's not perfect, right? But actually, let's say always it's not perfect. So not dwelling on, hey, we missed this time, or I got sick here, or I got this injury, or you're just going to get to the meet, and there's going to be enough, in, enough good stuff in the bank to go to that bank and be like, I'm ready, you know? Um, so that's, I think that story was like one of those things where it's like, I had a girl last year who was not, this is what the Razorback was like, I'm not going to swim in college. So, you know, uh, I'm not going to do, she was, she was doing a great job coming to like eight workouts a week, doing the doubles, doing everything, but I'm not going to swim in college. And then, you know, she does great at summer and crushes it at sectionals. And now all of a sudden now she's like, going on college visits and I'm like you know what I changed her path and that's like awesome so you're not going to remember what your 100 breaststroke or 200 breaststroke time is but now you have an opportunity because somebody came in your life and made you believe you can do something you know um, and and that's what I really enjoy most and I worked I worked really hard on <clears throat> trying to get those um, trying to get people to buy in like I don't give up on kids you know, like, cause they don't always all buy in at the beginning. And, but ultimately like, but you have, you hold them to a really high standard and you show them how much you care and eventually they buy in and when they, and, and, and they get some results along the way. Like you don't have to be a hundred percent bought in to experience some success, but then you get some of that success. And then hopefully that, um, hopefully that changes. Like it's, it's all just an evolution. Um, you know, I'm not looking for somebody at 15 that's like perfect right um so i mean i know no one is but i just that's just the way i i like to look at it like i don't know Love find it. a find a good in people find find some find a way for them to be successful and then just keep feeding that to them until they find other ways to be successful and you know and get to a point where they're really really ready to do some great things and and ready to do great things without us, you know. Being, right, you know, exactly. Move on and and do great things in college and for other coaches. That's a great resp response, man. I love it. I'll tell you, I, as we're sitting here, my notifications go off, and that kid, Matt Sates, uh, he, he just broke the junior world record in short course meters. He went three thirty seven in the four hundred free just now. Uh, three thirty seven. Wow, that's sick. Nice. He, he, did you, did you watch his two free? Yes. Oh man. He swam that tough. tough. He was good. Good on the back end. Unbelievable. And yeah. Yeah, I'm just watching all the updates from the, from the world cup meets that are happening. The one in Budapest right now. We have a, we have a team there. Uh, let's see how they do. But, nice. you know, I, I think the other, the other thing, Mohammed, that we've been able to, to have the great fortune of is have some athletes that, that get us around some other great coaches. So besides, uh, you know, Chuck and the Eastern Zone crew, uh, who do you watch and, and who do you learn from that maybe you don't see every day, but maybe you reach out to them or you watch what their program does? Um, I, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm never shy to reach out to people. <laughs> so uh, I will say I'm incredibly impressed with Ken Heiss at the Mason Manor Rays. Uh, and I have not, I have not now, you get to, now you get to yuck it up with him in our <laughs> ask a board meetings. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I look forward to that, but man, it's, he's impressive. Uh, I mean, I just like with my groups and it's like you're coaching 20 or 25 kids and you're like, every one of you could make sectionals, regardless of your ability, you can get there. That's not a big deal. And I'm just watching him you know, and, and thinking that's pretty good. And then watching him do that with a group of athletes for like, you know, he, he goes to winter juniors with like 30 kids, right. Or, or like summer juniors or nationals. And, and it's, it's just so impressive because it's like, yes, there are those standout kids and they definitely help like a, you know, a rising tide with all ships. But when, when, when you just have that kind of depth that those meets, you know, it's a pro a, a program uh, that's developing that and not just um, individual athletic abilities. Um, and that's been just so impressive to me. Um, but I, honestly, I, I will say Nick Rice uh, from uh, Massachusetts, Brent Arkey from Sarasota, he's, he's one that's 
um, always willing to share and, and uh, open up about different things. And, and I like to plan my seasons sort of the Jan Ulbricht science of swimming way. And he, he does the same thing. So we have a lot of, a lot of, I have a lot. Of, I usually, I'm on the receiving end usually with, uh, with all these coaches, of course, but um, it's, it's like, he's got the background and, and the success and I lean on him a bit. Um, uh, Coach Greg Troy has been so generous uh, with his, with his time and his advice. And, and again, like I, I networked with, with those people through our, uh, Eastern Zone connections. So Chuck was always really good. And Tom Speedling earlier in my career was always really, really good about introducing me to people. And, and uh, I've always just cherished that. Um, Ryan Brown out in California, one of my biggest mentors. I got to watch him coach. Uh, like he would come to St. Peter's after when he was no longer with Agua, he would come to St. Peter's with like Michael Smith and Lauren Mortford and a couple other swimmers would pop in. And I just like, that was like my crash course in coaching, right? Because everyone at the time was like, Brian Brown was this yardage Mongol. And then you stand on deck with him. And yeah, they're doing some work, but man, he's doing more technique work than it's anybody so I've ever seen, right? It's and it's so like, smart. right. And it's just like, blows your mind because if you just go by what someone's reputation is versus like being on deck with them, it's, man, it's, and I did that for six months, like four days a week. and. I feel like that was worth more than my college education. I, I'm know? gonna tell everybody right now, work works. The first time I ever heard anybody say that was Brian Brown. Yeah, I know the story behind that. So yes. um, he, he's at Agua uh, and Brian was one of the first people I reached out to because Bayonne is a very um, urban area, Jersey City, very urban. So I'm like, man, this guy is really crushing it in New York City. So let me call him and see you're in an urban area. You're working with a lot of different kind of backgrounds and how are you getting it done? So I call him and I, I mean, I'm still a nobody, but then I was really a nobody, right? I was like 21 years old. It was 2007. I call him and he calls me back the same day, right? We did not, we did not know each other. Called me back the same day. We had a pretty nice conversation. Turns out our, our situations weren't quite as similar as maybe I had envisioned. Uh, but yeah, but anyhow, the story behind work works is, uh, you know, there's all kinds of people like, you know what works? Or, we do this dry land, or, or you know what, this this works, or this works. And then he just, Brian's a very passionate individual. So he got up and he was like, you know what work? Works works. Mm. You know, it's like, work works. And that's, and that's kind of how that um, started. And I know they had it on a shirt at Agua, but but like, listen, hey, it's uh, not trademarked. So it's, and it's a great message. So there's, Kudos to you for using it. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I, I asked him permission a long time ago, too. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, back then, I, you know, we, we were, we had some really good young age groupers coming up. And, uh, you know, I got a front row seat to the development of Annie Zhu and Leah Neal just by going to, you know, Metropolitan LSC championships. And I remember those girls when they were swimming in zones and just watching them come up. And he was masterful. With, he really was with their development and then you know when rachel came in she did a great job really picking up where he left off and she guided them really well too so that was fun to watch and uh you know i i like you i was able to be around so many great coaches um when, when i was young and now you know on the ask a board it's just a great resource and i know you'll use that but i've really been following uh chris plum and Carl. oh he a hundred percent He's one that I don't have a personal relationship with, but I'm in, always incredibly impressed. And again, I, he was probably the one that turned me on to like science swimming. And I'd ask him some questions like, well, if you don't know the first three chapters of this book, we can't even talk. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was, I mean, not, he was, he was always much nicer. Yeah. But, and, uh, you know, philosophically, like we're on different ends of the spectrum, but there's yeah. so much good in there too. So you know, definitely encourage young coaches to continue to do that and reach out. And these people are, you know, they're like your neighbor. They'll, they'll give you everything they possibly can. And, um, you know, it's very fortunate to, to be in that position. But when you think of uh, the direction of the sport, Mo, like what, what are you excited about with the direction of the sport in our country and, and with the ISL? Uh, the ISL is, is really cool. It's, uh, I know like 
firsthand from people that have competed in it. They're like, that's the funnest swim meet I've ever been to. You know, it's like back to summer league. So I've not been to one. Jonathan competed in the ISL the first season. And then I remember talking to coach Troy about it. And he said, uh, Caleb had so much fun doing it. And he himself, you know, being on deck there couldn't like the, the production is crazy. I think it's pretty awesome. Um, I think, you know, our sport is heading in a, in a pretty healthy uh, direction, you know, with, with, uh, Again, going back to approaching, I think there's more of a focus on looking at the whole individual, the whole child in the age group swimming and then a little bit more of that in the, in the collegiate realm. But I do think that's, that's uh, something I've embraced. And I think that's something that's really exciting that there's a place for everybody to swim. Um, there, you know, it's, you don't have to be not. And, and again, like I think working with some really good athletes, you understand that this is not everyone's path. And it's, and if, if you're passionate about that path, then that's great and you can pursue it. But like, you could under, you could also understand that um, this kid, it's okay. You want to be a boy scout and you want to, you know, take extra academic stuff and, and we have a place for you. And I think that that's been really, really great with USA swimming and a lot of clubs have embraced that. I mean, it's, it's really the only way you could have 500 or 600 kids on a team, right? And I think there's a ton of uh, programs doing a really nice job with that. So I, I, I do believe that it's a, an overall healthier experience for, for kids um, to be in our sport, uh, regardless of motivation, ability, or aspiration. So that's, to me, that's pretty exciting. Um, I do worry, and I know that was not the question, but I do worry about like college opportunities for swimmers. And I, I think that um, in a lot of ways, uh, the recruiting schedule moving up earlier and how uh, you know programs being eliminated and then the top end programs being so ultra competitive that it's it, it almost um, it's starting to feel like at the next level beyond club swimming or beyond uh, age group swimming, there, there just seems to be less opportunities um, even for some pretty good swimmers, you know, some swimmers that would have had some pretty good opportunities 15 or 20 years ago uh, are now kind of looked up from the, on, on the outside looking in. So I know. I'm so glad can, that you said that, Mo. Yeah, I, I, right now, I have seven seniors that they, they could all swim on pretty much any team. And there's no room. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, back back at Scarlet, we kind of prided ourselves where, like, if you could do a really good job in our senior program, even if, let's say, you're not the ability level, you, you're you not going to be in the way. You're going to go there, and you're going to get better, and you're, you're going to contribute to whatever program you go to. And, and we had the reputation where Indiana would take chances on our kids, Minnesota would take chances on our kids. And I'm sure those, those coaches are still very, very much open to doing that, but I think their hands are tied behind their back with roster limits that may not have been there five years ago. And just the way, um, even the, the extra year that everybody's getting and the more frequent gap years and all that kind of stuff there, it just seems like, I, I hope we get out of it. I know there's a few more programs that are, that are starting up, which is awesome to see, uh, but that, I guess that's my biggest concern with, um, with swimming uh, right now. Um, well, we're talking about athletes with win multiple winter junior national cups not being able to swim in mid-major conferences. That's wild. That's wild. I mean, I, I think I have one of those and, and we're working hard on trying to get them placed. But yeah, it is kind of wild. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what the solution is or um, but I, I guess the ultimate thing is as long as these kids are obviously they're chasing a dream and it's awesome, but as long as there's the understanding that regardless of what the future looks like, this is still making you a better person and a better individual. I think that's, that's, that's a good message, right? Instead of like, if you're only doing that to swim in college, that's kind of a rough, that's a rough starting position because, um, so if you're doing this to better yourself and be in a healthy 
environment with like-minded people and challenge yourself. And then, you know, if college swimming is on the horizon and it works out, that's great. But if not, you can still take all those, you could still take all those values um, with you in, in whatever endeavor you pursue. Uh, then that's, I think that's a good starting point with athletes, but I do wish that there were more opportunities because it is a nice motivator for a lot of kids. No doubt. All right, Mo, here we go. The million dollar question. You ready for it? Do it. All right. You've coached an athlete from age 10 all the way through senior swimming, through their collegiate years. Maybe they come back, swim with you as a pro. When they hang it up and you say, what have you learned? What are you hoping to hear? Oh, man, that's a great question. Uh, that they could do anything, you know, that I could uh, just be, find, find a way. I can find a way. You know, I think that's, that's what our program has been built on. You know, that it doesn't have to be the same way for everybody. I've alluded, that, uh, I've alluded to that earlier, but I feel like I want kids to, to know that if there's a will, there's a way, and, uh, and it might not be a straight line. It rarely ever is, but I, I can find a way to, if there's something I really want, I can find a way to do it, you know? I love it, man. This has been a fun hour. Mo, I appreciate it. How can people get in touch with you if they want to ask questions about your program or if they want to know how to throw in 50, 50, 50 flies? <laughs> uh, they can email me at coachmo at aquahogs.org. Uh, I mean, I'm on, I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Uh, you can look me up. My name is going to be on the promotion. So you can look me up and reach out to me there. Um, and yeah, I'm an open book. I'm, so many people have been so generous with their time and information with me that I'm humbled if anybody asks me, you know. Well, I appreciate it. We all appreciate it. And Mo, I know that uh, we'll have you back on the Coach's Corner someday soon. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Mike. Appreciate the opportunity, man.